Hello, this is Haga Devin, and today we are reading Act 1, Scene 3 of The Parable of the Wayward Prince, also known as uh, Soliloquy. Hey, I'm not sure how to say that, actually. You'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute here, though. Anyway, if you like this, this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. After this, we'll be getting back to our regularly scheduled, um, Bellaverse content. This is supposed to be a part of Bellaverse content, actually, but as you might have seen, we aren't seeing a lot of that here, are we? Anyway, let's get right into this. <clears throat> David Escobar came to wishing he had a blanket. It was freezing cold in his field. He mentally kicked himself for not bringing a jacket or gloves or sturdy shoes. He glanced up uh, from where he was lying in the grass, saw several distinct landmarks. Oh, it's Washington, he thought. I always heard how cold Washington was in the winter, but I never felt it before. Probably lucky it's not... Wait, what am I doing in Washington? Last thing I remember, I was... And David realized the world around him was in black and white, and the crackling of snow beneath his hands as he rose up, up down far away, like it was happening underwater. This wasn't real. It's very real, David. A voice said in front of him. Just strange. David looked around and examined his surroundings. He saw a tall elderly man walking across the great revival of Adio. The White House, he realized. Another man was hiding, squatting around a corner, waiting for the old man to walk past, holding two pistols. Oh god, he's going to... Shoot him. Yes. The voice in front of him said. It was like David's eyes were early focusing to see something that had been read from him, but that he didn't want to look at. Suddenly David saw what was there. A man, tall, wrapped in a long, dark blue cloak, facing away from him, facing towards the scene and unfolding in front of them. The old man kept walking forward, oblivious. He passed the corner where the man sat, hiding. Twenty. Ten. Even five years ago. The voice from David said, He never would have been so stupid as to walk unaccompanied, not paying attention to his surroundings. He just left the funeral. You see, his mind is dwelling on thoughts of death. Thinking about his wife, dead five years now, and his brother, married before his eyes when he was a child. And the many men he has killed himself. The man behind the corner emerged. Screamed incoherently, raised his pistol, fired at point blank rage into the elderly man's side. The man screamed as he fell, evident towards the, the gunman who raised his other pistol and fired into the man's chest. He has been shot so many times, risked his life so many times, but in the last, he dies now. David watched as the gunman fled the scene. He's going to get away with murder? Oh, no, the tall man said. He is completely insane. He will begin raving about what he has done in a paint shop not far from this place and will be arrested. A mob will lynch him before he can make it to jail after the trial. Never mind. People will believe the old man was killed by a vast conspiracy led by the British, largely for unrelated reasons. A war will break out, and the fifth way it did and in this time and period, there were consequences. Would you like to hear them? <sighs> Dave was horrified by everything he was seeing. Who is he? The dead man, I mean. One of the leaders of your nation state. Andrew Jackson. I thought he is somewhat important in your history.
I don't remember much about him, David thought. But isn't he on the twenty dollar er, bill? I think so, but I don't, don't recall very well. What happened if I stutter? <sighs> your idea of mind is in this place, rather than the flawed one of your more permanent existence. I know Jackson's importance. So many branching paths led from this moment. Some led to the to arist aristocratic dominion. Some led to civil war. Some led to mediocrity. Some led to greatness. One of them leads to a utopian world government that ends disease and death and takes mankind to the stars. One of them leads to a catastrophic plague wiping out the human race. I know one of them led to a catastrophic plague almost wiping out a lot of the human race, particularly in America. But none of them truly end. Not ever. Time marches on, as one of your philosophers put it. Lawrence, as I recall. So it's variety with assassinations. I think it is why I interfere in so many of them. Who are you? David asked. You know of me, the being said and turned to face him. David understood many things better in that moment. He understood why men went mad after seeing what he was seeing now. He understood why the only detail they remembered were the eyes. You're the man in the sundial. 961-1 we call you. I'm aware of what you call me, the entity said. The name is not less wrong than any of the others. I think of myself as the intruder. David knows his lips weren't moving. Then he knows the man had no lips or eyes, then no head. For a brief moment, he saw that the entity had both had and didn't have a face. David had stopped looking. My appearance is confusing to uh, uh, you. It is what it needs to be at the moment. Being such as yourself, receive from me what I wish them to receive. For example, perhaps I look like this. His face, clothing, body all transformed. The entity looked that and looked completely human. It was dressed in the same style of clothes the other two men had been. 19th century men to wear. David saw the figure shimmer, flicker out of existence for a moment, then returned. He reverted to his previous form. See, they thought I was one of them, the entity said. They was confused, then turned around, hearing voices behind him. The scene was very different. The shooter was being held down by several men accompanying Jackson, but Jackson was still dead. Others were attending to his wounds, but David knew who they would fail. Mm. I appeared at the funeral he was leaving, the figure said. I convinced several men to go with Jackson, fearing for his, his safety. They did so. I altered time, changed the past. A dramatic act. You see the difference? <sighs> David then. He was still dead, with whatever implications that held for everything. The nation. The world, he thought. The foundation, maybe. Who knows what that kind of change. Your foundation organization always exists, if I can help it, the NC said. Or something similar to it. I've changed many things many times and places, but there is a need for people like you in your group. Forces and beings that desperately need to be suppressed. David's mind was reeling. So much was happening back in the real world, and he was here, watching a deranged time traveler, a demigod, just by himself. He had to get back. Hmm. 
Not a demigod, David, the creature said. Many things, but not godlike. Just trapped. I have an obligation to undo certain errors I have made. And this is where you come in. Whether you like it or not, you are a part of those mistakes now. And it is part of your future. <coughs> okay, that's a bit odd. And it is part of your future to help correct them. David was stunned. Off, you're forgotten. And he said, What the hell are you talking about? I began doing this out of pity. Of sorts. I found myself in possession of certain abilities. Felt I had an obligation to help. I want to help people. I did. <sighs> One of my first actions, I tried to tweak a military contest. One from long ago. I was so sure, or I understood enough, that I could avoid the pitfalls. I was sure I could make this world a better place if I could divert all the energy that this species spends on warfare, channel it into more creative tasks, centuries, millennia of constant fighting and killing and dying. So I changed the outcomes of a battle and waited to see how things unfolded. I was so stupid. Everything is permanent, you understand. Even I cannot undo and edit once it is made. You can change things back, but there is always a place somewhere where everything remains. The world I made when I changed that also there, and now it is breaking into your world. Others as well. Their technology is powerful, but incompletely controlled. I could add certain aspects of this world, but I cannot leave it. I cannot even know with certainty what will happen if others leave, or if the errors can be rectified. But there are certain guesses I can make, certain extrapolations of what that world looks like, of what can be done to protect this timeline, of what has to be done to protect us all. David stood there and listened while the being in front of him spoke. He detailed a lengthy plan, maybe an impossible plan, a plan that would involve dozens, hundreds of factors going together perfectly, even before the completely unknowable part of that would happen on the other side. David asked questions and they answered them in such a way as to persuade him that the plan was feasible. There were holes, of course, but the entity helped, promised to help as far as it could. The being flickered in and out several times. I have made certain arrangements that will make the task you must perform easier. Make sure the first half specified is at the designated location at that particular time. Make sure her instructions are clear. You'll remember this conversation very acutely when you awaken in, the, in, your, in the containment area. Your actions are responsible for her actions, and the damage that could ensue, ensue if she fails is incalculable. Do you have any final questions? Two, David replied. Why do you care so much about our, we about our welfare? If you're outside of the timeline or however you exist, why are you so concerned with what happens? <sighs> the entity paused, stood silently. I can accept that humans are inevit in e inevitably bound to destroy themselves, the entity finally said. What I cannot accept is the idea of myself as the one who destroyed this species. Others can ignore the rapid decline of cultures, nations, civilizations, knowing they are powerless to do anything about it. I do not have that privilege. As poor a choice as I may be for this task, I am the one who has it regardless. I cannot stop.
David had no choice but to accept this answer. He had a second question. Why do I feel like getting warmer, he asked. More humid, actually, Danny said. I have had a change of heart. Look. David turned and looked at the spectacle behind him. I you see it had reset to the beginning. The elderly man walking across the sea, the portico, talking to his friends, his cane tapping against a stone. The man with two pistols, lying in wait. The man walks past the corner, the assassin raises a pistol, all in his right hand. Click. The first gun misfires. He raises the second pistol, aims directly for the heart, prepares to make history. Click. Jackson's friend had to restrain both men. The assassin who was trying to flee, and the president who was trying to beat the man to death was his cane. <sighs> they will recall how un unseasonably humid it was, Randy said. The model of pistol he was using will be remembered as one with a high probability of mechanical failure in human conditions. It will be known that the statistical likelihood of both guns failing in remains remarkably low. It is a sloppy job. Dandy said for a moment. It will do. Dave was no longer even surprised by this. He turned back to Dandy. How do I get back? Quickly, Dandy said, and David disappeared from the White House lawn. The intruder said, and watch the scene for a moment, and disappeared as, as well. It's a mission. Good morning, sunshine. Alright, I'm gonna grab... a thingy. Hmm. Anyway. Light streamed into the room for, through two windows, and the original awoke. You see me, the intruder said. The rest of them cannot see unless I shut them, unless I show myself to them. But you know you, the original said. I am built to know. I am built to see. I am. Where is my maker? The good doctor works elsewhere now. Reassign. My siblings. For the first time in many millennia, the intruder was afraid to respond. They are no more. The other being thought for a moment. I know. I... I'm not sure why I asked. I saw what happened as soon as I woke up. What was seen was ten rows of ten columns and beds, and uh, from the next room, a voice said, Congrats, Dr. Crow, you've done a good show, but 99 total are dead. What is left? You perceive the world in a weird way. In a way like, unlike any being I have ever seen. You fascinate me. How does this create an organism like you is beyond me? Then I can't hear anymore, Olympia said. I see you now, and I see you before, and I see you soon. You are outside of time, I am outside of you, but still attached to this place. <sighs> the intruder was frightened, in a way. My point stands, you possess precognition. You can see many paths of time, many choices. No human can do this, but a human built you. A dog built me, the ritual said. The humanity... He left him, as he left me. What was done was Dog Dog saw the dead horrified at his mistake, put the first on ice. Why am I here? Your thoughts are jumbled. You are insane, the intruder said. You exposed something you should not have been. Your siblings as well, but they did not have the same attributes that you did. They succumbed um, to tall psychosis and died. T 
Telekyo, the ritual said. Telekyo equipment at least, the intruder said. Telekyo was the to include in your physical matrix, but professional but Professor Crow removed it before production went online. Your original form contained significant amounts of it. For our testing has revealed the language and communication skills of persons with regular contact or ex and exposure to SCP-148 will over time deteriorate and disappear. This has not happened to Umi. The original saw the file, saw the words, saw the author of the words, saw the author of the words, dying 16 years from now. Many things happened. You were transferred to another body, but there is damage. Damage to your memory. Damage to your personality. It was not believed you would survive. I cannot uh, die, the original said. The intruder nodded. You realize this, then? Professor Crow theorized it, but I did not know if you would understand. What was understand was this is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the containment chamber in which you were probably securing for the L5 Council. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Why should I? You are doing this to me. The being known as Olympia Zero said. Not per se, the intruder replied. I exist across multiple realities in multiple times in many places. You can perceive these realities and being in your presence is, is exasperating your schizophrenia. You will have greater control over it when I have left, and after I leave you will never see me again. What is your purpose? Olympia said. Olympia asked. A question I have asked myself many times, but which has no bearing at the moment. You are built to assist the Foundation. There is an, op an opportunity now to do so, a mission nobody else is capable of completing. After it is finished, you are free to do whatever you want, go wherever you like. If you wish to avoid the Foundation, it is that what they will have anyway, finding you anyway. But I will protect you if necessary. That is payment for your services. And if I say no, Olympia replied, you turn was silent. Then I will not leave. Ever? Olympia asked. It seems you would I'd have to wait some time. Eternity, I understand, is somewhat lengthy. You would be irreparably insane within two hours of continued exposure to me. The intruder replied, I'm free for two hours. Olympia could not think clearly, but understood there was little choice. I accept. What is the mission? A short trip, followed by a shorter trip in a different location. I will take you there. A moment passed and the room was empty. Lights moved in from um, windows on all sides, and the wayward prince was bored. We finally meet the, the title character. What is next on the agenda? Mofanes asked. Several new victories in the province of Deserts first, his strategic counselor said. Significant in victories? The current state of military balance makes it difficult to establish a precise system by which a single victory had altered. So no, in short, Mofanes said. His counselor shook his head. Long pause, and Mofanes looked at his surroundings. There was more than he could have really he dreamed of where he began when he began his endeavor. Certainly, he had thought that victory was possible, or he wouldn't have begun this war. But this was the Chancellor's Hall, the top floor of the Great Tower. Significant parts of the city, town really, of Ex Alexandria were visible from the windows. This was the tallest building in Savannah's far and away. Not that what that was a terribly impressive statement to make, but a backwards province, even the university here was impressive only by provincial standards. Larger, better facilities existed elsewhere in Novo Mundus, just as even better facilities for us existed once in the old world. Mulvane's gaze are to the natural philosophy building. We have one advantage, he thought. We have, however, captured certain prisoners first, the counselor said.
<sighs> Noah Fiennes hated his title. Cream of Harvest, he called himself in the old tongue. First among equals. It was so e egalitarian. It appealed, to, it appealed to his sensibilities at the beginning of this war. He was a very different person now. What are we to do with them? Secure oaths of loyalty to our cause. I'm sure many of them have longed for freedom in the changed world. Give them the opportunity to make that change. Those I resisted may be the imprisoned until our victory. Very good, sir, or scribes, if you would be so kind. Yes, yes, I know, the cinematographer said. I'll go get some water. Thank you, scribes. The counselor watched the other man leave the room. <sighs> well, fans, are you sure or about him? Thought I might in particular, not terribly, the rebel replied. His attitude has worsened significantly in recent days. We could potentially replace him. I mean, recording is to be of the others. Is it really necessary, especially in light of these water breaks? It is important and to preserve the historical record, Melfans recited. When we are victorious, it will serve to remind all the people of the sacrifices, the decisions, the deliberations that went into their new nation. It will inspire them to maintain the traditions of freedom, of honesty, of morality that we are fighting for. What are we to do with the prisoner or in that serves them? Figure out, out which ones have useful information and rip it out of them. Give them a masala afterward. The council wrote this down. Within hours when the message had been conveyed to the Milfans troops, 60 prisoners would be put in, in a device that ripped their memories out through the microchips in their heads. Afterwards, the record would read all that all of the prisoners had cut their own throats out of a misguided sense of loyalty to their previous commanders. No question. No questions would be asked. What other business should we discuss while the eyes of history are blinking? Belfans asked, unsmiling. Rumors abound among the people. They said the government is massing troops, legionnaires, and hardened integrators alike to the north. They say that Anaxagoras is somewhere in Alexandria. Fomenting a counter-revolution, spreading lies. They say our war will soon be lost. Belfans thought there were always rumors, but there was some possibility of truth there. A stalemate had been going on for too long. An attack was inevitable. Their first strike had turned dozens of integrators to their cause, seized four whole providence in two days, disrupted no of 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 and communications, and turned their cause from backwards protest and a spoiled nobleman into a real a revolution. And some very real dissent among the government had pushed him along, but one side could only keep the momentum for so long. Melvin was hoping his next initiative would begin the end of the war, but if the government attacked too soon, there was real danger of defeat, and Melvin's complete belief seeking into enemy territory is exactly the sort of thing that fool and Agoras would do. Redouble scouting efforts. If the former chancellor is really walking around his old kingdom, I want him found, and I want anyone working with him found. I'll reprogram the microchip in his head myself. I'll have him singing my praises right before he cuts his own throat and starts in front of one another. I want that dog freaker back in his office by the end of the week. In this office by the end of the week. Do you hear me? No offense was shouting that. The counselor had grown used to these tantrums in, re in recent weeks. If you are interested, he said dispassionately, we recovered another book today from the Natural Philosophy Experiments. Milfans fucked up. The experiments were occurring on their own now, opening pearls between this world and the other at least daily. Milfans had integrators trade in recovery out all over Savannas, hoping to secure some advantage from the other side. Most of what had come through were trinkets, incompatible technology, minor artifacts, acts. What is this? he asked. A text produced by that organization over there. You know the one. The base. Foundation? And no offense corrected. What foundation text is this? The counselor looked at his paper. 
The title translated to Guide to the Procurement of Human in Questioning. We could not discern what human was, but it appears to be a concept involving torture or interrogation. Several interesting techniques are used over there. All crude physical methods for obtaining information, but quite creative ones. Yes, Millefane said. It, they are creative. I always admired them for that. Admired, first, the counselor said. Is that why you sent that thing to them? Millefane shrugged. It was early in the war. I was afraid the government was in alliance with those Foundation people. I sent them a distraction. Why do it now? Of course not. But if Anisadora functions as predicted, the world will not be interacting with ours for a long, long time. That is true first, the counselor said as the scribes returned into the room. That break was satisfactory, sir, he said. Belfane nodded. I am satisfied. Let's continue. Act 2, Scene 1. Repel. Look, the story so far. <sighs> the story so far. Warning, security identification and road calls corrupted. Excerpt. Report. KB615. User, Dr. Mario Jones, Director of Records and Information Security Administration. Level 4 authorization and required. Outbreak of SCP-877 was possibly inevitable under the circumstances. The record trips were never fully contained and were propagating in the wild. Our containment policy was based on the assumption that chips, A, would remain in an animals, and B, that any infection involving humans would be suppressed by Foundation efforts. And C, that no enemy group would attempt to use SCP-877 to their advantage. Premise A was highly unlikely, if justifiable given premise B. The Foundation had a few options about to try uh, to find more chips, the term had to prevent their propagation, and hope for the best. Premise C, however, was logical only as long as enemy groups of interest remained ignorant of 877's and its existence. The latter was compromised due to with the principality of to the <sighs> Why well, pause here. This was difficult to write under the circumstances, but it was honest, and the man in question would agree as well. Administrative Incompetence of David Escobar, Director of Site 38. Several of the Soviet Orients had sold samples of, of 877 were conducting human experiments on the class personnel on its site without his awareness. Available evidence suggests they had made arrangements with groups of interest, Gamma 3, Chaos Insurgency, to trade the technology, along with some applications that the Foundation at large was not aware of, in exchange for some form of compensation. The Insurgency Handler is responsible for these research Archers were captured two months later and revealed many details under interrogation. The researchers would have been executed after delivering the microchips. An unknown entity identified as Anisadora was found to have infiltrated the outskirts of Site 38 and had taken direct control over the 877 instances. This creature is believed to of travel here via the same Einstein Rosen mechanism connecting our universe to that of Alexa University. This takeover of the site occurred in less than an hour. Efforts to repel the from Site 38 were undertaken by a mobile task force, Row 1, the principal unit assigned to Site 38, and used for recovery of Alexa Ova University artifacts. Row 1 was deployed in the field during the continuing breach, but was unable to return within hours. Several components of the incident are not, and due to the unavailability of witnesses, never will be understood. Specifically, most relevantly, the involvement of Professor K in Pathos Crow Olympia Zero entity who entered the field and began assisting in decontamination efforts. The manner in which Olympia Zero became involved or even came to be 
in the vicinity of Site 38 is not known or understood at present. <sighs> why a site? There was so, so much I didn't know, and why I didn't, I didn't know how much that even the poor vessels involved in the clusterfuck knew while they were, they were taking part in it. Why it was said, it almost it was more by the loss of information and then the loss of Site 38 itself. All things considered, the Foundation was like nowhere else off without one more backwater. But there were only two people who really knew what happened that day. The full story. Of those two, one was dead. The other was gone and unlikely to return. David knew what was coming. It was obscene to him and offensive. This was real. This slaughter. People were dying by the dozens, or worse, turning into integrators or service or whatever the hell you caught someone enslaved by a machine in their head. And David knew this or, that Site 38 was a stage, audience of the researchers, Mary Lee players. And a freak with no eyes was directing the show. And David had the script. All he could do was watch. The sundial was still in the room as David walked out, turned left, and walked down the hallway. Turned right, 2D class, zombie walking towards him, covered in blood, holding assault rifles. David had to admit to a certain sense of amusement, knowing what happened next. A shimmer and something vaguely related to a human was standing between him and the service. The f female? Doctor had read the file once but wasn't sure. Humanoid turned, saw the class who paused. Unknown entity, the first race began. You're required to. The humanoid's foot cracked across his finger's neck from the side, snapping it. Blood poured out of his mouth and nose. The other D class began to raise her gun. A blur two feet in the barrel of the rifle spring through her chest and out through the back over back. Another service turned the corner, reacted to the sound. Fire erupted from the arrow, shaking the dying human, and the gun was sticking through. Three bullets, head, neck, and chest. The shooter propped a foot against the class, pushed with her and some entrails coming out with the rifle. Turned. Face David. David Escobar, she said. Olympia, David replied. You have been briefed? Same as you, he stuttered. As I said before, I'm not doing stutter, I just... It feels... It was insulting. You were not shocked? That that thing showed me all of this already. I'll I'll be okay. Very good. Let us proceed. Olivia walked down the hallway, David behind her. There's going to be a lot of this, isn't there? David said, try not to slip on the blood. You know the answer to that. Fair enough. David blocked out so much of what happened that day, half from horror, half from genuine sense of existential overload. How do you deal with a universe where the plan was, has not only been written, but laid out in front of you? David watched Olympia kill at least a dozen of his researchers, all infected. Not that that mattered, David knew each and every one of them had selected or been involved in selection of each one, who knew their families, knew how hard it would be to explain this carnage. And Olympia didn't seem to care. David was walking in the shadow of someone who was, by all evidence, complete without conscience. She had a mission, and that was all there was to her. It had been several hours since the two of them had materialized in Site 38. He knew there were exactly 13 infected individuals left in Site 38, not counting the things surrounding the countryside. But there was something to do at first. Voices in front of them, spoken oddly by individuals not capable of telepath communication. Uninfected, David and Olymp. Empia stopped, took her behind different doorways. This is Bravo Team, a voice said. Have always secure. Moving into hallway Alpha 3 Charlie. Two camouflage individuals with an assault rifle. I was looked around the corner, saw no one, turned the corner, and began walking towards two concealed indiv individuals.
Olympia pointed handgun over her head and fired two rounds. The task force agent and dropped to a prone position, returned fire, and shouted some warning. Dave was only half listening. Agent Razzi, Agent He's Agent Sue, hold your fire. Olympia shouted down the hallway. I just need your attention. We are not infected. More shadow warnings, several more bullets from both sides, when agent began to throw a smoke grenade. Olympia fired around down the hall, hit the agent's hand. David noticed that she didn't end, end look when she fired. The sound of lasted six minutes. Tell your commander that H.M. Harris is between the trees, Olympia finally said. Some more shouting down the hall, some speaking from the radio. It did silence. David glanced down the hall. The agents were shifting uncomfortably and looked pale. Footsteps were coming towards them. The man who came up behind the mobile task force agents walked with authority. Everything about him exuded it. He was the sort of man who inspired loyalty without words. An hand gesture as he walked past the two agents in the hallway and they stood at attention. David had recommended this man for his current job well before he was director of Site 38. William Lopez, Commanding Officer, MTF Row 1. Lopez walked up to where Olympia was standing and stopped. He glanced at David and looked him up and down and dismissed him. He did that a lot. He turned to Olympia. How the fuck do you know who Isham Harris is? That's not relevant, Major, Olympia said. But I was told that you would recognize that phrase. Lopez looked Olympia up and down it as well. Nobody calls me Major anymore. Who the hell are you? Olympia holstered her gun. My name, my name is Olympia, and you're going to help me save the world. It was like baptism, or birth, transcendence, transfiguration, like a first breath in a new world. The Minotaur's body didn't breathe, though it, but there was no reason to break the, the metaphor. Until recently, the Minotaur was a metaphor. Until now, his goddess had blessed him. His service was his honor. The Minotaur turned his head to the left. He heard the sound of scraping stone and paws, for realizing it was coming from him. To his left were several dozen sects. X, all with the, the words, Apollodris Construction Combine, printed on them. Behind him, his head turned fully around. It wasn't as though oh, the Minotaur had an actual spine column to deal with. Several human service instances were stirring a vat of what looked like concrete mist. X. The server stepped away from the vat and stopped serving. The moment the concrete mixture slowed, 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 a ripple, then another, a shape moving beneath the surface. A hand grows from the mixture, dripping, then setting. A metal scaffold sat beside the pit. The arm grew and grabbed around the bars to pull itself into a gray swamp. The Minotaur looked at the new creature, humanoid in shape, though well taller than the humanoid than the human that had parasites. Two, almost two and a half meters tall. Arms, legs, torso, head. The arm had fractures where the elbows would be. The legs, likewise, had crevices where the rock limbs separated. They functioned and as knees. The Minotaur did not understand fully how they worked. He looked at the cracks in his own arms where his, his rock fists were connected. He wanted to rotate it. He wanted the face to rotate, it did so. This was not important. His goddess willed it to be, and it was. He looked at the, the doppelganger. His face could not smile, but he felt something akin to joy looking at the other being. The horns raised from the other head uh, from the other's head were black, the same as his own. This was a gift from his goddess. Their goddess. Minotaur looked at the Minotaurs looked at one another. Without a word, they began walking towards nearby complex. The concrete mixture rippled again as they began to hunt. Whew. 
Hmm. Commander Lopez looked at Olympia. Can you prove a single, a single thing you just told me? About our mission? Hardly. Olympia shrugged. That you will have to take on faith, but you cannot deny the logic involved. You see an 877 outbreak. You have been seeing increased activity from the microchips for months. Some of that could have happened on its own. This, however, is too much. The world next door to ours is staging a break-in, and this is the window they're coming in through. The only device is capable of traveling between worlds is stationed in the physics department of Alexeyeva of University. I invite you to draw your own conclusions. Lopez said, act quietly. Let's say you're telling the truth. How the hell are you involved? Aren't you supposed to be in a shed somewhere? Storage facility, David sputtered. But that's not relevant. You need to give the order, Major. If you need done, Escobar. That's the best reason I could think of of why it's fucking stupid, Lopez said. Remember that even in your version of events, it was your incompetence that let this all happen in the first place. You think I don't know that, Lopez? They replied. You think I don't know I should never have had this job? That the Foundation made a serious fucking error in hiring me in the first place? Believe me, nobody's more aware of this than I am. So order this for godforsaken and place blown straight to hell already and put me out of a job. Give us all what we want. Lopez sat and considered this. He turned to Olympia. What kind of munitions do we need? Fuel air bombs. Preferably multiple passes over the site to be sure. They're going to be um, aware of the incoming bombs in a few moments. So we want to hit this uh, area surrounding the site as well. Possibly for a kilometer round or so? That's a hell of a lot to cover up, Lopez sighed. Kind of attainment breaches typically are. Olympia replied, coming to her, bre to, coming to her feet. Not sure what else you expect. Lopez nodded as she and David walked towards the door. I'll make the question. I mean, I'll make the call. One more question. And though, you said they're going to be aware the bombs are coming. How are they going to know? Have they. They infiltrated. At our communications? Possibly, but I doubt it. No, I'm going to tell them about it right now. Lopez had no time to react as Olympia and David left. Act 2, Scene 2, Negotiation Jesus Christ, Agent Anusilov said. Caliph, come take a look at this! Agent Aziz walked over to the other man. There was now... they were now standing in front of a two... Ooh, two and a half meters tall statue, and a dumb, uh, um, ugly one to boot. Did you ever see the Dark Knight Rises? As I said, if you look at at a right angle, does it not? Holy shit! It's Bane. You still have said. A big ass statue of Bane with horns! Why the fuck would somebody have as it was interrupted by an enormous stone fist crashing into his side? Breaking five ribs and knock <coughs> knocking him to the ground. The Minotaur ground the concrete point joints of his legs to move it towards as its supine and body, while the agent was copying blood onto himself. Agent Yuslov's safety was already off and his rifle was on full automa automatic. Die, motherfucker! He shouted, blasting in, in 50... 556... X rounds... Into the statue's... Upper torso... Into the statue's things upper torso at point blank range. The rounds bounced off, taking a few stone chips with them. The statue rotated its upper body along the... Place where its waist should have been. 
splitting its upper half without moving the, its lower half. This is why you uh, uh, usually need a hammer to break these rocks. Curse of the Kingdom of Logic taught me more about that. Every time with his face is is once, and so, uh, you slips head over with rage and ro lo and knocked you slop down like a ragdoll with one concrete right cross. You slop's neck broken, he lost consciousness is instantly blood streaming from nose and ears as his breath ran racket, trying to suck in air through a collapsed lung as he dragged himself across the ground away from the sun creature. The minotaur stalked toward toward Azus. Oh, oh, Azus wheeze. A voice booming from the something from no one place in particular, it seemed to exude from the from the creature's body at once. He bled so much, as is, it said. I wish it was you. I want it to be you. Suck air and scream, Helmanid. Die for me. As is obeyed. David heard a sound on behind them as he and Liv Olivia walked down the hallway. Empty of your one agents had largely secured what was left of Site 38 proper. While the infected creatures were absolutely intimidating against untrained researchers and scientists, they stood little chance against armed foundation infantry units. The footsteps behind him came from Adrian Lopez, Girl One's commanding officer. Now wait just a goddamn minute, he began. There's hardly time. The infection in the building may be gone, but I think controlling them isn't. And it'll keep spreading infected creatures around to propagate itself. We have to move quickly before it starts again or escapes. I've already e ordered the bombers to come level this place to the ground. We're securing all surviving personnel and, and evacuating. Whatever the thing is, it'll be another state in the middle of a big-ass crater in about 45 minutes. If you really want to help, help with that effort. You want help evacuating citizens? Fine. There are two living, uninfected individuals in the basement. Your men will overlook them if you don't search urge it specifically. A researcher named Storm and a professor are named Nexer. It is... Uh, Specifically vital that you rescue these two individuals. I have not liberty to discuss why. Bullshit, Olympia, David thought. You have no idea why any more than I do, but the intruder was very specific that these two had to survive. Maybe more than we do. They are finding the last part. Well, especially more than some of us do. Awfully quiet there, Escobar, No, Lopez sneered. You going along with this dumb shit? You don't have to understand, Commander, but that that's what's going to happen. Are we going to the woods outside the site, Olympia said. I just, I just you keep evacuating. Additionally, I would suggest you equip. That's about goddamn enough from you, Lopez said. I don't have the manpower to arrest you, but I sure as hell won't sit here and listen to you. Tell me how to do my uh, job. Our equipment is more than fine for these old fuckers. You might be surprised at what you're about to have to deal with, Major, Olympia said. Consider getting rocket propelled grenades and other explosive ordnance from the armory. You have bigger fish waiting. And they ran end up beside. Amanda, sir, the earth black is referring losses from the courtyard. The aide said, they're not making any sense, to be honest. Something about statues with hordes? Radio communication has been lost with two fire teams. Should we send in reinforcements? Yes, of course, Lopez turned and looked at Olympia then back at the aide. Statues. That's what we... Heard over the radio before communications were lost, he said. Lopez looked back at Olympia. RPGs? Explosives in general should be effective, Olympia replied. 
Hmm. Pedro, get it on the line with the team closest to heavy munitions locker and tell them to start equipping with RPGs and grenades. Put all units back into the building. Yes, sir, the aide said, walking away. Lopez heard and saw Olympia and David turning a corner away from him. Chancellor and Exegoras felt ridiculous wearing the hat. It was remarkably effective, even underneath the traditional robe of a second order university scholar. He knew he would be recognized by nearly any free citizen in walking on the campus. As well, he should be under, in, uh, under other circumstances. This was his university. He was their chancellor. Or should have been, rightly, but this was Melophane's territory now. And so he needed the hat. A wonderful gift from his friends across the space-time continuum, he thought. The hat rendered its very or unrecognizable. It was impossible to focus on individual spaces or identities regardless of the amount of effort put forward. And seriously, it even obscured its own presence, so he noticed the user or the headwear atop his head any more than they recognized the man and himself. This worked to his advantage. The man and Exogoras is met with outside at the... Natural philosophy complex were loyal to him. There weren't many of those around, but Melophanes was by this point relying on technology just as much as the Primax government was. Men like Anaxagoras, who understood the value of personnel, of personal human loyalty, were going to decide this war. Possibly today. Sixty loyalists were starting to gather here, though most also were still lying low and surrounding a jungle. A crowd would be suspicious. They would not move until the order was given. Melophanes had recently ordered classes to begin again, hoping to inspire a sense of normalcy. The sudden message that the war was already won, or, or both. Either way, the opportunity was almost here. The gongs rang out over the campus, and Nexagoras saw his class gather behind him as he walked over the stream and towards the building. Rows were convenient for hiding light plasma carbines and counterform grenades. Alia Elacta Est, he said, crossing a bridge, his arm behind him. Awaken, child, a voice said be behind Agent Eastman's ear. Don't move. Eastman heard approximately everywhere, but not move was remarkably easy. He took in the breath and began to breathe out of ground. No, stay quiet, the voice said. This will help you feel better. Eastman felt the creaking, stabbing, and burning engulfing most of his body began to obey. Since he was moving, he didn't have much opportunity to explore how extensive his effect was. I was guessing that whatever was doing this, this was doing it well. I release endorphins into your bloodstream, the voice said. Now listen carefully. And Isidora believes you're still asleep. It all came rushing back to Eastman. The attack at Site 38, being captured, the trip to this uh, place. His heart began pounding. There was almost certainly some un or something watching him, ready to hurt him more. Eastman had been hurt enough today. What Inesidora intends to do to you is unspeakable and incomprehensible, the voice said. Now listen carefully. You are in an antechamber to the central throne room. Soon an opportunity will arise to strike back. When it does, do not hesitate. Another opportunity will not be forthcoming. Eastman did nothing but lie still, but he acknowledged what he heard. Good luck, the voice said. Eastman felt it leave him. Are those the Minotaurs? David asked as they walked through the Site 38 a courtyard, seeing in the statues beginning to circle them. Yes, Olympia replied. Did you have any idea the Apollodorus concrete could do this? 
They crow around into enormous quasi sentient abominations against God. No, can't say it crossed my mind. Fair enough. The Mantars began to close in around them. Their demeanor, insofar as Stone can have a demeanor, became more aggressive. They were clearly preparing to hunt. Olympia withdrew an object from her belt about the size of a golf ball. <sighs> Lipka threw an object from her belt or about the size of a golf ball. She pressed a single or button on and rolled it in the direction of the two humanitarians walking towards them, compared to close to one another. The belt beeped quickly, then stopped. The expression from the anti-matter grenade completely destroyed one of the humanitarians. The other was slightly further away and lost only an, a leg and an arm. Falling to the ground, the other humanitarians stopped in their place. I'm told the human expression is, take us to your leader, Olympia said. As the two walked towards the concrete palace of Anasodora, four unmarked stealth fighter bombers were en route to Site-38. Major Lopez's task force was carrying on the evacuation, and a box opened in a room. In the chaos of the evacuation and the entire onslaught, she had little difficulty sneaking out of the building. The Hominids did what? Gaz is Anisadori, her regal fury dripping down her flesh, the man of the service instance. The service twinged. It twitched. Wow. And the story was not overly communicative at the best of times, and her wrath was severe when she detected failure among her subordinates. This instance was bleeding from every orifice in his face. She had detected a significant amount of failure. And the story continued to dig through the service's mind. She saw elements of the cute of the hominids who had the Amerity to approach her home, one she recognized. The Kello ape left in charge of the nearby human facility. The other one, Anna Sidori felt pain looking at the other at the image of the other entity, similar to the humanoids but different in some un imperceptible way. Anna Sidori was birthed in a different universe, and her and her perception of this one was subtly different. Things around her shimmered with an alien nature, seemed unclean, wrong in some way. She had to work on that once she ruled over this world. But the other creature here seemed detached from this world somehow. Universal. Unbound by the space around her. Beautiful in a way, but a threat. Anasodora did not tolerate threats. She started to in e e to let the intruder said. Olympia and David stood at the doorway to the palace. It was more like an enlarged concrete shack. Not even the size of a regular home. They was not inclined to be impressed in particular, and this didn't do the trick. They stepped across the threshold. David had seen the film Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex but were too afraid to ask three times in his life. For this reason, his vision of the sight before him was that of an enormous pale breast laying on an enorm on a similarly enormous concrete slab. Six individuals stood around the slab. David didn't recognize any of them, and they weren't in uniform. Judging from the age and gender mix and their general similarities in appearance, David guessed there were two or three civilian families. The one individual, a boy, David, as fine to be about saving, Evan, laying from the slab, bleeding. What the f what is wrong with these people, David thought. He knew what was supposed to be happening, and this was roughly in line with the plan the intruder showed him, but the actual sight of it all was horrifying, and the intruder hadn't shown him quite all the little details. <clears throat> hmm. Hominid Escobar, comma, David Carter, unknown entity, you stand before the goddess Anasidora. A voice boomed. Several voices, David realized. The people around the slab were speaking in unison, including the bleeding boy.
David looked at the thing on the slab again. Porcelain white, at least from your tall, roughly spherical, but sunken, like a deflating beach ball. The outside of it, whatever the hell it was, grippled like the thing was made out of gelatin. Two of the individuals sang around the slab, a man and a woman walked to the bleeding chair. Wow. Seeing them next to each other, and David could tell he was their son. They stooped down and lifted the child up, the father holding him to his chest. They walked up to the slab, chat his child on the forehead, and pressed the child against the white form. I'm back first. You will not object to my dining in front of you, the individual said in unison, before white tendrils was exploded through the boy's chest. The tendrils wrapped themselves around the child's limb, was pulling him closer. The boy's eyes floated up in his head. The child's body began to be absorbed by the white blob. You have disturbed me, Anasidora said through the civilian's mouth. They could help but notice the boy was still speaking as well. I appreciate you are attempting to donate yourself as nutrient supplies, but as you can see, I am quite well fed at present. What is your business here? You are going to die in eight, 18 minutes, Olympia said. Several airplane eagles that are, what are no, carrying what are known as fuel air bombs are going to descend on this particular piece of terrain and completely sanitize this area. Your present form, as well as the forms of most of your service instances, will be burned into oblivion. Your man to our servants may survive temporarily, but they will be badly damaged, and a cleanup operation set in by the Foundation will eradicate them one at a time with explosive ordnance, if need be. And you will be dead regardless. The boy was almost completely absorbed at this point. Arden sucking sound come from his corpse, the room was silent as Anasidora pondered. Presuming that I am mortal, and for such for which I would destroy any individual were I were to hear it. You are speaking of certain to you for Zoom. Additionally, that I have no means of escaping this fate. You do not. The bombers have been specifically instructed to target this building with multiple thermobaric warheads. And to continue the bombing into a radius farther than any of your servants can travel. I am sure you are aware your service is inside at Site 38 have all been terminated. Your attempt to colonize this world has failed. Further pondering. This allows me the possibility of killing you now in a single, albeit petty act of vengeance. A final satisfaction before my death. Olivia paused, sighed. She knew what would happen now as well as David did. David thought the, he detected some um, hesitation, which was admirable but pointless. The event was unfolding in real time. There was no way to avoid it. Say it, Olympia. Say it next time. David said, I'm ready. Olivia had no reason to feel sorry for David, had no particular reason to like David for that matter. Get her next predestined words to it seemed to come out strained. Finding fate, David thought. I'm flattered. I... She began. I cannot help but notice you have no armed service here. Here we go, David said, taking a last deep breath. Let me correct you! There was a new voice that time. One from behind Olympia. David turned and looked, knowing already what he would see. Hmm. <sighs> 
What was I? Oh, right. Today, Amy McGilligan stood at the threshold to the palace, holding a pistol. Amy with the pistol at Olympia. David snapped around, ran towards, standing in front of Olympia, McGilligan, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet left the gun. David couldn't see the bullet, of course. His brain couldn't work that fast, but he had seen it before when the intruder showed it to him. When the intruder showed David his own death. The bullet lodged in David's chest, barely missing the heart. The pain was excruciating, but David remained conscious. The diamond from Olympia, a straight from an action movie, had saved her. Just in time for... Two more gunshots. McGilligan had something out of the corner of, had seen something out of the corner of her eye and fired at hitting, hitting Agent Eastman in the upper leg. Eastman had gotten his own shot up, catching McGilligan in the head. Both fell to the ground. That the remaining voices in the building cur is That's impossible! What are you? How are you doing this? You are now completely out of options, Olympia said. Shaking with rage. Murdering my colleague has gotten you nothing. There is one, precisely one chance for you to survive the next half hour, half hour, and it is with me. Why would you save me? I have need of you, or that is a part of you. I know you came in here in some sort of larval form. Did you not when you traveled here? I, and Isidore, a pause. I do not recall the full details of my origin. I have vague memories of my existence in that world. Little more. I recall existing as a smaller organism, yes. I recall you omened explaining my identity, my role as the destined ruler of humanity. I was offered this plan as a gift. I'm realizing this hominid lacked the authority to make this exchange. To say the least, Olympia said, if you reproduce this larval form, you, if, if you can install your consciousness into a mobile form, I will take you li with me, you and one of the Manitars, but you must act quickly. Where would you take us? Anasidora asked, to have a conversation with the man who sent you here. Olympia replied, Milfane stood in the counter form reactor work room. So this is where the magic happens, hmm? And taking this of Alexandria nodded. Yes, is this your first visit here? Not quite, but this cat form reaction was not yet complete when I last visited. Well, thanks, and replied. I was my student here then. This was the talk of the campus. The talk of Alexandria. Clean, nearly infinite energy. Of course, we had no idea what that energy would do. Certainly, we have begun to determine the pattern of porthole openings. The portals between our world and the alien one. The seemingly random pattern to their openings. Actually, has a geographic pattern operating in a angle spiral centering around this location. So the Privax government has been conducting technology that answers at these spots. I mean, they've encoded this pattern already. And taking this pause. First, this appears unlikely. Had they made this discovery, we could have we would have found evidence of it when we took control of the lab. It is a discovery that only could have been made from this lab. I worked in this lab before you liberated it first. And I can assure you that Odeus had no connection to the Primax government. He despised Primax Naripa as much as, well, as he despised me. Yes, I know. Well, thanks. Respond. But if the government had no knowledge of when and where the portholes would open, how could they exchange technology with... <sighs> Pause as Melophanes recognized the depth in, of his error. The other universe, they weren't helping the Ripper at all, were they? It seems impossible first. Melophanes thought of an anasorda, of the sabotage of the other world he had committed, of the fate he had condemned him to. That is unfortunate, I had already... Melophanes heard gunfire off the, in the distance. Wait, not very distant. And within the building, the distinct sound of plasma carbines.
Why is that sound? He asked over the long wave transmitter. Encouraged within the building first, a voice replied. Loyalists, we believe Anax Agoras is leading them in person. Call for... A read forces a ring back up into the confirmed chamber, he shouted. This was not an opportunity he was going to miss. First, increase energy discharges from the reactor. I think a porthole is opening. Hmm. Why have we stopped? The Minotaur asked, challenging the guys that held in its hands. This is the spot, Olympia replied. This is where the wormhole will open. Organic tissue would be the damage by duration of this endeavor, but we should be fine. Thunder. No, not quite thunder. A booming sound from above. Deep of thirst and growing high pitch. Not above, around them, all at once. Olympia looked around. The world disordered itself, like looking through a glass in a rainstorm. The distortions intensified around her until the world grew brighter and brighter. Bright light, white noise, then... Act 2, Scene 3 Denouement and Epilogue So yes, this is the end of this story. <sighs> I'm just gonna go ahead and take a drink. Delicious. Anyway. The universe as it is currently defined by humans began and will end in ways that are inconceivable to any iteration of humankind that currently exists or will exist. At a time when the descended race of Homo sapiens and, and sapiens gets an understanding of cosmic genesis or ishatology, it will be a group of organisms so all totally separated from the human race that there will be nothing between humanity and the species that can be adequately described as a relationship. This group of organisms will also not be a species in the taxonomical uh, sense, nor organisms in the biological sense, nor a group in a sociological sense. At the moment, they gain this uh, knowledge. I was watching. I believe they perceived my existence at that time and place. Knew that I would be in that, that place at that time, in the way a human knows a spider's web is in the same corner of the same room for years without truly considering the existence of the spider. They knew of my presence. They and knew how powerless I was, how devoid of relevance to their lives and purpose. Their lack of regard for my existence made my existence less real. They th they frightened me. <clears throat> I am intruding, and this is the concept by which you understand me. It is the concept by which the author writing this work has chosen to define my existence. I would not bother attempting to define myself in other work, in other terms, as this distracts from my purpose at this time. I have selected 13 excerpts from events that occurred in several relevant universes. I shall present these excerpts as a completion to this story. They are ordered in a fashion that I understand will reveal these selected events in a flat, ultra-relevant fashion and build anticipation towards what should be a climactic ending, though this will not necessarily resemble chronological order as you understand it. I apologize for the inconvenience. A, ma a man begins writing in the story. He is trapped in a loveless relationship and builds components of his life into his work in a desperate attempt to make it a relevant to somebody, anybody, even himself. He builds me as his deus ex machina, and will forever doubt about the validity of his decision to create me. The recursion does not end. David Escobar was expelling copious amounts of blood onto the floor of 
a structurally sound but aesthetically unpleasant concrete structure when the thermobaric warhead struck nearby. This was the ending David Escobar anticipated and did, and did not disappoint him. One warhead detonated less than 30 meters from its location. No traces of his body were found by the investigators who arrived later. He laughed as he died. Olympia's Seneg muscles were still burning by the time she reached Alex Sylvia. Dr. Crow either had not thought how to redesign the development of lactic acid in overexerted muscles, or had not found it possible to eliminate the pain. Or he had concerned himself with it when you I like this. The roads of uh, Alex Sylvia, as with most with the cities of the civilization, were designed in, in concentric circles around a central approach. Acropolis. The original of this was an attempt to integrate Greek worship of Apollo with one of the indigenous religion's creation myths. Neither of the religious is practice were legal in the no of a modern state, though for these of both remained throughout of the society, a fact virtually unknown to the vast majority of this of citizens nationship. Olivia approached the large exterior of the city, quite clearly as circle CXLI. As you can see, a cross street nearby marked radius. Um, and they need this. I cannot read that. Alex of a, a university was 70 circles further inward and five right at a clockwise. Olivia knew. She continued walking. All the first houses she came to were unoccupied. The city was clearly planned out to an extent that was never necessary for its population. These houses were old, smelled old, likely never lived in. She continued inward and found houses that had the slightly more signs of life, but still empty, abandoned. No signs of actual battle. The citizens were afraid of something more abstract. <clears throat> Sheer political uncertainty can have that effect. She drew closer to the university. She heard shouting and sporadic discharging of some kind of weapon. It's a caught of rhythm that is recognizable and in any environment. The buildings of the university were only slightly larger than the houses immediately surrounding it. This university was unfamiliar with zoning regulations as such. She passed a series of houses, another radius is, and was immediately on the Alex Ilva campus. The natural philosophy complex was nearby. Entire military units were engaged several blocks away. Olympia heard Whatever weaponry they were using, it was energy based. Thorns of violet plasma blasted down the street, scorching the pavement as whichever army was coming toward the university missed her target. Screams came from the same direction. She continued toward the natural philosophy building. Due to what she could would call luck if she didn't know better. The most immediate armed guard was distracted as she approached. She died immediately, and Olympia was now armed. She proceeded inside the building. <clears throat> mm. Two individuals survived the destruction of Site 38, rescued by Rowan and helicoptered away before the bombs began to drop. Commander Lopez looked at the two about sleeping. The researcher had awoken by the time Lopez and his men had gotten there, and she and the prisoner were crying in one another's arms when the soldiers came into the room. They were in each other's arms on the helicopter as well. They were virtually inseparable. And Lopez didn't have time to argue with them. It was some kind of sweet, and Lopez couldn't deny it was a little refreshing after the hell he had just pulled them out of. Though he couldn't help wondering what made these two so goddamn special in the first place. James looked at, at James McGulligan looked at Greg Eastman as well as she could. A grazing shot to the head had split her skull open, and her eyes were not working exactly as they, they should have been. But the pain was keeping the microchips at bay, and she saw him nevertheless. Of course, she had always loved him. Nothing romantic. He barely registered as a man in any kind of romantic sense. No. Greg had always been had always been some kind of rudder to her. Worked together ever since initial training. Is it more 
time together in the most romantically involved opposite sex couples in human history in all the years since, let alone two friends. And now they would die together. Eastman looked at James, saying much the same thing. He would have been crazy to have never felt anything sexual for James over the years as she had for him. But they were both professionals and smart enough not to get involved in that kind of thing. They were her comrades. To what risk is she? They heard the planes overhead, heard their as well, superior calculating like a madman to their side, but all they saw was each other as the bombs hit. There is a detailed story to be told of Olympia's seizure of the natural philosophy building, but it has little purpose here. Suffice it to say that a combination of stealth, overwhelming strength, and literal foreknowledge admitted. I knew details of personal, uh, personnel movements gave Olympia an insurmountable advantage over all opposition within the building. Olympia reached the bottom floor of the building. The counterform reactor was enormous, an experimental prototype. The Chancellor of the University, Anaxodor, uh, had never, having rather insisted that Alexiova remain in relevant and scientific advancement of his nation. Nevertheless, given the rather horrific potential consequences of the possible Release of the reactor's energy, certain precautions were simply obvious. Putting the reactor underground was one of them. None of that's going to help them much now. Olympia thought grimly as she made her way across one of the catwalks. She was suspended at midway in the air above the reactor when everything happened very quickly. A, a chopping, a shrieking sound, a bright light rushing from her peripheral vision, a growing sound as a plasma wake melted and ripped the catwalk prop right directly in front of her, destroyed her supports for her trust of catwalk she was standing on. A rush of panic as the metal beneath her feet fell all away from her as she felt herself lamenting to the solid glass floor of the reactor chamber. The wet dunk of her own skull slamming against the floor, but steps walked towards her. A quiet, growling speech, in a language Olympia didn't fully recognize. She could pick out a, a couple words, a couple of Arabic, another word. Finally, the voice, Mel, she recognized. He got repeating one word, starting at first, but as his pronunciation grew sharper, she could make out what he was saying. Function, he said. Function, foundation, foundation, you foundation! There is a rather, there is a remarkably climatic scene where that occurs when an Anxiolus arrives in the counterform a reaction chamber. Melophanes is still there. Olympia has lost consciousness, regained it, and is pretending to be asleep. Anaxagoras inks up on Melophanes and disarms him. The two battle hand to hand using a variety of arcane martial arts techniques. The former using an incredibly well crafted at home skilled with older traditional school of combat that lag using a less disciplined spying ink style whose unpredictability catches Anaxagoras off guard at many times during the fight. A symbolic metaphor is played out rather graphically, written on a glass floor in blood and sweat. This battle between old and young, between the progression and reaction, between Zeno's arrow and the a man duped into holding the target. When it is done, when the hourglass of this eternal dance runs out of sand, Olympia kills the if a survivor and takes the plasma weapon. I would not tell you which one of them won, because as I watched them fight, I watched them die. I watched them dissolve into gamma rays and dust a bare half hour later. Death transcends all victories. A small quantity of motel tap so of her uh, forgetting where our has been placed in a very specific distance outside of the city of Alexandria. It is growing into uh, the shape of a small animal making haste away from the city as quickly as possible. It will not be seen again until it wishes to be, and until a master wishes it to be. I had shown Olympia what the correct sequence of controls would be to overload the counterform reactor. She remembered very well. She carried out the sequence and left the building as quickly as possible as was possible and began running again. She would not have survived less than a second before the reactor detonated, and there was one more flash of light. So much reality 
it with assassinations. I think it is why I, I interfere in so many of them. I do not wish to give the, the impression that I am omnipotent. I have limitations, the same as any being. When viewed from an objective standpoint, I cannot see everything. I cannot see all possible futures. With assassinations, the future takes very concrete forms. Once the redundancies work their way out of the system and the band narrows into stronger paths, there will be po perhaps a dozen possible futures for a day the living to inhabit. Just gonna go ahead and. I believe this satisfies the still of being primitive earth within me for cleanliness. I had never deliberately converted a power or generation facility into a weapon of mass destruction while enabling a sentient warlike telepathic imperialist to begin infecting a, a planet. I never went out on to perform such an action again either, and unique actions are so rare for me. When the reactor fully destabilized into a matter-antimatter -matter explosion, I saw all of the possible futures that ever forward the world so bleak, so devoid of hope. I saw the detonation, the energy and matter being ripped apart plastered across the landscape. It was so near to sunset, too. The view was magnificent. Hundreds of thousands died. The voluntary evacuation of Alexandria of forests had allowed the number to be so low. Those that died and had entered the city armed and intending to kill one another. They burned together. I saw the beginnings of the swarm. The rock soldiers and their master had learned from their previous encounter with humans and became smarter. The rock spread new armies and attacked piecemeal. <clears throat> the attacks picked up, killing a few more here and there, destroying more properties, building new outposts for their own reproduction. When the true battles come, they could hardly be called that. The rock armies of Andesidora are legion. They are perfect of allegiance as they fight the, philosoph the philosophically fragmented human enemies. No mercy, no retreats. Frizzle is only for food. By the end, Anasidora must breed human ends as cattle to keep herself fed. There are deviations from this from time to time, but this was the overarching future of Novamundus. Alexei... Alexova University Burden fell, barely ahead of its own patron city that burned fell around it. The nation that housed the city burned and fell before one of Alexova's creations writ large age and filled with rage, a time that should never happen drifts into the ash heap. It was a sloppy job. It will do. A man sits in a recliner, sunset orange, kept purring directly to his left. A laptop is the only source of light in the room. He considers the amount of time he has spent working on the project he is completing. The amount of time considering writing, rewriting, editing, opening, and altering only a few words before closing it again. And falling asleep before the project. He has an anxiety about showing his work to others. The anxiety he always feels. He is always afraid of rejection. He faced quite a bit of it over the year and a half since he started the project. He dismisses those, those others who take Take too seriously the opinions others have of his work. But deep down, he will always see everyone who doesn't take away from his work exactly what he anticipated them and take away as a failure, a personal defeat. He considers erasing the whole thing, leaving the story unfinished. So few people are left even to care now. He considers his wife in the bedroom next door. Some rejection over that year and a half, yes, something's lost. But so, so much more gained. He smiles, publishes his work, and closes the circle. And that was the end of the story of the Wayward Prince. I wonder where I'm going to title this. It's going to be another silly title that's probably going to get way more attention than I would expect, but anyway. If you like this video, holy crap, it's in an hour and a half. Back on topic. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. 
who knows what I'm going to be reading tomorrow, but I'm almost certain it won't be this long again. But until then, goodbye.